heartbreaking loss every day. Bless the thousands of people around the world who are ill or who have lost loved ones due to this pandemic. Keep us close to you and in good health so we can continue to serve our community. And please watch over our loved ones and keep them safe from harm. Help the people and businesses in our community to cope with the negative impact that continues to be felt across our city, our nation, and around the world. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and We'll give this a try today um, and uh, the city clerk is in the building and she is uh, listening and doing her duties so uh, we've worked this out and I think we'll have a, a good session today so we'll begin with public comment so Howard I'll defer this to you uh, for reading the public comments we have a number the powers that be to place multiple slow speed or minimum wake signage inside and at the approaches. The pass is very narrow and boats could collide or cause an accident. Much appreciation for your kind consideration. <clears throat> the next is from Bill Courtney, Burnt Star Isles Association, regarding additional speed limit signs in BSI. Below is a letter of support of the proposal to install additional speed limit signs in Burnt Store Isles. On March 6, 2020, the Board of Directors of the Burnt Store Isles Association unanimously approved a no motion to request that the City of Punta Gorda proceed with the placement of additional speed limit signs within the community of Burnt Store Isles. This request comes per the recommendation of Chief Pam Davis and after many discussions among the Board and community members regarding how to better slow down traffic within BSI. At every monthly BSI A board meeting for the past year, various issues related to traffic flow, excessive speed, and near accidents with pedestrians and bicyclists has been raised by residents. The Punta Gorda Police Department, and especially Chief Davis, have been very cooperative in helping to try to curb speeding through the use of the radar cart, police cars along the side of the road, and other measures. But they cannot be everywhere, and so the problem continues. While additional speed limit signs will not by themselves solve the problem, the BSI board believes they will serve to remind residents, visitors, and commercial traffic of the 30 miles per hour speed uh, limit especially along stretches of the main streets of Madrid, Tripoli, Monaco, and Macedonia within the interior portions of the community. Please let me know if you require any additional information on what the next steps in the process will entail. The next input is from C.J. Metcalf, also Burnt Store Isles Association, regarding the placement of speed limit signs. As the BSIA Board Director of Security, I feel it is my duty to follow through with all our community concerns regarding safety. The BSIA Board has received many concerns about speeding within our community. The Punta Gorda Police Department has worked with us continuously to resolve the speeding issue. 
With all the do walkers, dog walkers, runners, and bikers in our community, I find it prudent to support the placement of speed signs. We have looked at all aspects of traffic calming, and this would be the first step in resolving the issue. Next comments from Faith Ferris, also regarding speed limit signs in Bernstor Isles. As a member of the Bernstor Isles community for 17 years, and as a Bernstor Isles Association board member, I want to support the need for more speed limit signs in our community. Currently, we have only two speed limit signs at each entrance of BSI. As a resident, I have often observed drivers exceeding the 30 <coughs> miles per hour speed limit on a regular basis. We have a school bus stop on Monaco and Madrid. Monaco is a street that runs through the entire community and drivers tend to pick up speed on this long stretch. This increased speed is a danger to the school children waiting for the bus and the parents accompanying them. Additionally, many of our streets do not have sidewalks and residents walking their dogs are put in a dangerous situation with vehicles driving faster than the speed limit. I have served as a BSIA board member for the past year and a half and have observed that almost every monthly meeting there is a discussion about speed and traffic issues. Therefore, I support the proposed plan as presented in the reference agenda and request the City Council approve the subject agenda item to increase the number of speed limit signs in BSI at the locations recommended. <coughs> The next is from Mary Boringer, again regarding speed limit signs in Burnt Star Isles. There are only two speed limit signs, one at each entrance into BSI. It is my feeling that a few more speed limit signs placed strategically throughout BSI would help to curb excessive speed. Um, now we go to a new topic. This is from Craig Ivey regarding uh, Gill Street parking. During the new business section of the agenda, there is a planned discussion of parking regulations that is being sponsored by the Punta Police Department. The summary describes a narrow issue on one block of Gill Street. I trust that the PGPD and the residents surveyed have a clear understanding of the need to address the parking situation. I urge the Council to broaden your review of parking regulations in the downtown area. Specifically, I am concerned about overnight street parking by non-residents in our neighborhood. That concern arises from an event when a stranger entered our home earlier this year shortly after midnight. Thankfully, the individual left without incident. Recently, a group of like-minded neighbors met to discuss concerns in the neighborhood. Subsequent to that meeting, we created a framework for overnight parking regulations in the district. The framework was shared with city staff and they responded favorably. The framework offers a means to administer a process for residents that require on-street parking and the costs are minor. The area that borders the waterfront from Fisherman's Village to US 41 is enjoyed by residents and non-residents alike. I encourage the council to consider restricting overnight street parking in the area to enhance the safety and security of our neighborhood. The proposed framework advances safety without creating a barrier for non-resident visitors. The next is from James Round regarding Gill Street parking. Your April 15, 2020 agenda includes parking regulations on Gill Street during weekends. However, there is a need for parking regulations everywhere in the West Historic District every day. There are many streets like Gill, too narrow to accommodate parking on both sides and allow passage of emergency vehicles. Obstructed views from on-street parked cars is a universal problem on the west side, especially when exiting your driveway. Also, cars parked on narrow streets opposite of driveways make it nearly impossible to back out. Continual infill of homes and duplexes with no or inadequate off-street parking causes conflict among neighbors. In addition, special events throughout the year compound the parking problem. Also, with the current economic strife and possible displacement of people in America, 
it would be a good time to enact an ordinance prohibiting overnight parking in Gilchrist Park and the nearby streets by non-residents. I support my neighbors on Gill Street and the police in their effort to regulate parking. It is my hope that parking will be regulated in the West Historic District from downtown to Fisherman's <coughs> Village and from Gilchrist Park to West Virginia Street. Thank you for your consideration. Those are all the written comments. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, we do not have any proclamations or presentations today, nor the introduction of board and committee members, so we can proceed on with our agenda. And there are no public hearings or quasi-judicial public hearings. We do have an ordinance um, for the Resolution. It's a, or excuse me, a resolution. Um, and I'll turn this over to our city attorney. Good morning. Uh, this is a resolution which I'll read by title only. A resolution of the city council of the city of Punta Gorda, Florida, approving the ground lease between the city of Punta Gorda and Peace River Wildlife Center, Inc. for the Henry Street parcel and providing an effective date. What we have done is uh, our paralegal assistant at a city manager has worked with the Wildlife Center folks to put together a lease that we think uh, and hopefully uh, took all of your comments and included them in a 50-year lease with an opportunity for renewal, um, a dollar a year, and included in there is stipulations for time frame of when they would do phase one and a time frame for phase two. Um, the city would be responsible for making sure the area is uh, free of any uh, materials on that site. There we go. Um, we can certainly go over all of the parts of the lease if you would like, um, but we think we got in there everything that you asked for and uh, included also in there is the stipulation that depending on how the sales tax goes um, if by some chance we don't have a project uh, because the sales tax doesn't get approved uh, we still have to improve parking for the dog park as well as the wildlife center and uh, we would also put in there a temporary restroom similar to what we have at uh, we did with Gil Gilchrist Park phase one that type of a restroom facility if we needed to until such time as we can get that project underway the cost for that for Gilchrist Park um, trailer was 2850 a month 2850 yes 2850 a month. Okay. and that would serve not only uh, actually, it would serve History Park, the Dog Park, and the Wildlife Center, if need be, if we can't get that other project going. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're here to uh, hopefully approve the lease so the Wildlife Center can get on with their fundraising and design and get going. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm really glad to see this is moving along, and I'm very happy that it's working out to everyone's benefit, and uh, we look forward to the Wildlife Center moving into this space. Um, just a couple of questions that were brought up at my group meeting yesterday. Um, the, co the contract does say that the city is responsible for the basic preparation of the land, but there's nothing in there specifically about remediation. If there's soil issues that we discover there, I mean, there used to be fuel tanks over there, I believe. No. Were there, there were no fuel tanks? Not at that site. Okay. Where the library is. Okay. Library oh, I thought there were. Okay. So is there any um, potential issue that we may not know about in terms of things that are in the soil that we may have to remediate that might cost us significant funds? Our public works director at previous meetings, he's been here a long time. He is not aware of any. That's not to say that when you start digging in the ground, you might find something, but he is not aware, not that particular location that we're looking at. 
Okay, and then the second question was, um, with regard to elevation, are we going to be bringing in fill if we need to elevate that property to put the facility in? Uh, they'll be responsible for their actual foundation in the building. We have fill at Colony Point. If they want to use some of that yeah. for maybe the wildlife area, we'd be more than happy to. <laughs> so there were a lot of people that would like to see that happen yes, too. Yes, we would. <laughs> yeah. we would so love. if you need it, Callie, we, we would really dirt. love for you to use that. There we go. <laughs> it, would, it would stop a lot of the emails I've been getting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Those are the two questions I had. Debbie? Howard, I had a, a constituent ask me if those restrooms are ADA compliant. The, which ones? The, the temporary ones, ones? Yeah, the temporary ones. Oh my ones. God, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. The restrooms we had at Gilchrist Park, you had an ADA stall, you had a, a male and a female, and it was it was a nice, nice okay. restaurant. Okay. Restroom. And there were ramps up to it, I think? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. I they were quite that. nice. They were quite nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Thanks. Yes, actually, they're much nicer than the permanent restrooms. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anything beats the one that the Peace River Wildlife Center has now, so. Yeah. 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 Um, I had a couple of questions. Yes. Um, one of them is in the agreement on um, the first page, item 5A, the first line, the last word, and it says release. Is it the, the line, for those of you that are... Um, watching says use the premises for a hostel or native wildlife providing for the rescue rehabilitation release or housing of injured ill or orphaned wildlife and activities related to those endeavors including but not limited to and it goes along um, <clears throat> i remember one of our conversations in here in the council chambers was there were people that were concerned about the release of the wildlife from that location and i believe that the response from the um uh, the Peace River Wildlife Center was we would not be releasing from there. We will be releasing from the the rehabilitation center or some the surgical center, but not somewhere else, but not at this premise. So, um, yes. You can you can take the word out. Yeah, uh, Callie Stahl, Executive Director, Peace River Wildlife Center. For the record, um, just to clarify for everyone, we do no releases from any of our facilities. Um, okay. Our attempts are to get the animals back where they were found. If that is an inapplicable place, then we find another more appropriate rural place for these animals to go. So it would not behoove us to just continue to populate the area that we're trying to work in. So that word we're absolutely happy to remove. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and then I had a question from um, a resident that was wondering about the restrooms in the agreement number two on page two. Um, and it talked about um, the, the temporary restrooms. And it wondered, <coughs> it says the way it's worded, uh, the trailer for use on property. And when it, in the first page, it talks about property. And it says that's the Peace River Wildlife Center. So um, what they were wondering is, the question was actually, why are we doing that? And I explained that there are no restrooms for the dog park or whatever, but um, are there going to be any restroom facilities in the educational center? Yes, Callie Stahl again. Uh, yes, we will have our own restrooms within our new education center building that are for our visitors. Uh, what we're trying to avoid by asking the city to um, supply a restroom there adjacent to the dog park is to prevent people from coming into the center just to use our restrooms. Excellent. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the restrooms is all part of the sales tax project. It would be used right. by the dog park, the history park, right. the, the, the mm -hmm. linear park that's going to go the trails. Mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of uses. But I think that's important for us to distinguish because um, residents could think that, you know, I know that I don't think you have restrooms in the current facility, and you use the city's restrooms that are in the uh, Ponce Park. And so the perception is that you're going to continue to do that when, in fact, you're not. And, and I, that's um, an excellent point that you just don't want to have all the dog park participants, which there are many, um, or uh, whomever uh, coming in to use your restroom. So, perfect. Um, anything else? I make a motion. We approve the resolution for the contract for Peace River Wildlife Center. I second that. With, with the uh, deletion of the 
word release. Oh, yes. With the deletion of the word release. Oh, with deletion of the word release, yes. Thank you. I second it. There's been a motion, I believe, in a couple of seconds Yeah, here. probably. <laughs> uh, to approve the, the lease uh, with the Peace River Wildlife Center. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Yay. Yay. I'm really excited. I know we all are. And the rest yeah, of this is really good. Really yeah, excited as well. Yes. <laughs> and it's just in time for the giving challenge. Yes, it is. Outstanding. We're really I know we're making a lot of people out there that are watching this very happy that, yeah. that this is moving forward. Thank you. It's a win-win for everybody in it this case. Yeah. We need some good news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Um, so um, we can move on now to the consent agenda. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Yes, I would like to pull C1, please. Okay. Anything else? So we are pulling C1. Um, so um, would someone like to move to approve the consent agenda uh, move without C1? Move approval of the consent agenda minus item C1. Second. There's been a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item C1. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Mayor, since we've pulled the resolution from the uh, consent agenda, uh, I need to read the resolution by title only. Okay. This is a resolution, I'll read by title only, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, approving a development agreement with Southwest Land Developers, Inc. for the optional purchase of transportation impact fee credits, authorizing the mayor to sign the agreement and providing an effective date. Thank you. Oh, I don't know where that feedback is coming from. I don't know. It, it wasn't coming before when I was talking, right? Well, that microphone was giving some feedback on the other podium, and I think that may be part of it. I don't know. I don't know. It was, but it was, when David broke, was there, I don't we're know. Okay now. We're okay now. Okay. Must be my aura. There you yeah. go. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> is it something in your mask? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Um, my question is, can somebody really explain this so that the, the <laughs> average layman can understand it? Because I don't understand it. And I, and I was trying to explain parts of it yesterday to my, um, my cabinet group. And I, I, I'm a, really a little confused on this project. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll try and explain it. And after our explanation, uh, I hope everyone can see that it's actually to the advantage of the city. In 2014, uh, we, Committee Council, signed an agreement with Southwest Land Developers after they came to us. They uh, have impact fee credits uh, that Charlotte County uh, owes them for um, work relating to the Enterprise Charlotte Airport Park and South County. They did uh, infrastructure improvements and they got impact fee credits for those improvements. They came to us and they said, um, we would like to have an agreement with the city of Punta Gorda that uh, they, if, if we purchased their credits at a discount, and we would also keep an administrative fee for work in, uh, development occurring in the South County area, um, instead of sending, you build a house, you pay impact fees to the city and you pay impact fees to the county. If we did not purchase these impact fee credits, all of the dollars that the folks paid in impact fees in the city relating to county portion get sent to the county. We don't do that through this agreement. We use those dollars, those impact fee dollars that uh, new development pays for, and we purchase these impact fee credits for the South County area at a discount. I think it's a, I think it's 90 percent. I think that's what it says. 85. Okay, 85 percent. Okay, and we keep a portion of it for our, our administrative costs, and those dollars don't go to the county; they go to Southwest Land Developers. 
The city is not out any money, zero dollars. As a matter of fact, we get an administrative fee for doing this work. There is approximately $435,000 plus or minus still left in impact fee credits for the South County area. Uh, that's not an exact accounting, that's the amount that Southwest Land Developers estimates is left. So eventually it's gonna run out. What this agreement does, it extends the agreement to allow us to continue the process. The city is not out any dollars. We actually gain some dollars because they're, we're, we're getting some of the monies paid for by the county share of impact fees for our administrative costs. Am I on the right track? Um, Chris and Simeon Finance, that is correct. So previous to the agreement, um, whenever South, um, Southwest land developers would have a project within the city, they paid their city impact fees and their county impact fees. And then we took those county impact fees and sent them to Charlotte County. And then Charlotte County had to reimburse Southwest land developers. So then they said, hey, would you just pay it through Southwest land developers directly? And for that purpose, we keep 10%. But why are we doing this? Why is the city even involved? Because that property is not annexed into the city. I don't, that's why I guess I, I have a disconnect. Um, just because normally we would send those funds to the county anyway, and they would have to pay, like, so we would send a check to county, county would send a check to Sand <coughs> Southwest land developers. It just removes that one extra step. We're paying it directly to Southwest land developers. We sign forms that we send to the county to um, show that those credits have been used and um, that they're all notarized. So then we keep 10%. So and we keep an administrative fee. But it is in the city if they're paying city and county impact fees. No, 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 it's not. What that's Howard that's why I'm confused. Is that it has nothing. The the property that uh, Southwest land developers earned those credits on is not in the city. It is in the county. Oh, so they're not but, paying city impact fees. No, what? But what Howard is saying is when projects go on into the city, home building, mm -hmm. in our neighborhoods, those home builders have to pay impact fees to both the city and the county. Right. And so what Howard is explaining is that the city would normally then have to stroke a check to Charlotte County for those impact fees that were county impact fees because it all passes through the city. And instead, the county is saying, well, pay these fees over to South, because we the county is saying, we are in. Uh, we have an obligation to Southwest land developers to retire this, these credits somehow, and so since the city was going to be paying the county, the county said, "Well, Panagorda, you pay them," and and it's a. So instead of us paying the county portion, instead of us paying the county portion to the county, we're just paying it to the Southwest land developers at the county's request at a discount, it's a benefit to the city. It's an, it's an agreement, it's a three-way agreement actually with the county. So it's, it's a, a benefit. I don't know, this one's over my head. <laughs> I mean, this makes money for the city. I mean, basically they went and spent money and built out the enterprise. I, I got that part of it. And, I just... and, and so what happens is that the obligation we have financially to the county, we're able to actually actually we're able to actually pay our obligation to the county at 85 percent discount but we'd have to pay anyway mm -hmm. so this that's that's really what this is that for anyone who's doing any work here we've got to give the county let's say x amount let's say, say three thousand dollars instead of paying three thousand dollars we're giving 85 percent of three thousand dollars so those credits are being satisfied so this is just a way that it actually it's cash positive for the city in that way so anytime we as long until we exhaust these credits we're able to continue to um, pay them to the county at a discount yeah, until those credit, Southwest land developers' credits from the county are exhausted, we can continue to do this. When that's exhausted, then the deal is done, and we have to right. go back to just paying the county right. those fees. Okay. That's I understand how it can be. It's, uh, it's very confusing. 
It's very confusing. And it's really, it's really hard. It's pretty simple. It's hard for me to believe that the county thinks this is a good idea when they're losing 15%. That's where I'm confused. No, it, they, <laughs> they are going, it, it, I'm just they would have to meet their obligation anyways. I know, I understand. This is an agreement that. between us and Southwest Land Developers. I understand. I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I just think it's very convoluted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does sound convoluted, but yeah, I, I will have to admit, Works. I was on the city council when we passed it originally, and and I had forgotten how it worked, and I needed to have Howard, like, explain this to me again, um, because I remember originally when Gary Bain came to me and said, what do you think about this? And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so... I move for approval. A second. There's been a motion to, and a second to approve the resolution of the City Council approving a development agreement with Southwest Land Developers. Southwest Land Developers. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you for the discussion because I, I think it's, it's that was important to help our residents understand. I, I still find it extremely confusing. We probably needed a whiteboard to be able to you know, help our residents, help our council. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. 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 Thank you. So well, let's, uh, we can move into our regular agenda. And the first item on the agenda is approval of a change order number two to amendment number three of the master agreement to Hans Wilson and Associates. <clears throat> We're okay. Good morning, Anne Heinen, procurement. Um, this is for change order number two to the master agreement for Hans Wilson and Associates for additional construction observation for the Buckley's Pass project. Um, the additional fees um, for the construction observation um, was is for the um, rock excavation for the change order uh, previously processed for the contractor for the seawall installation. The total funds were not used for the rock excavation of the seawall. Those funds can be applied to the change order for the construction observation of it. Question. So is this in addition to the cost of the actual excavation that was done? Because the excavation cost us money. Yes, it did. When they had to remove all the rock. Mm -hmm. This is an additional additional dollars being paid to Hans Wilson and Associates for inspection services and overseeing the uh, the work. Okay, and um, at this point, we we pretty much have the finite costs of what the project is costing us, right? No, we still have to do a detailed accounting. All the invoices have to come in, and then at a future council meeting, we will bring you an itemized list of revenues and expenses and the dollars left over. Right now, the estimate is anywhere from 80 to 100,000, but we're gonna have a very finite number for you. Uh, I don't know which council meeting will have it on, but it will be uh, in front of you so you can then determine um, the type of refund. I ask that because I've already had someone ask me if they're going to be getting any kind of a rebate back for, on the unused funds. Yeah, and we'll have that accounting for you, but we want it itemized yeah. so it's very clear. Okay. Uh, I move approval of the change order number two. Uh, excuse me, number, is it two or three? Two to amendment three. Two. Uh, to amendment number three. Okay, I'm sorry. I move approval of the change order number two to amendment number three of the master agreement to Hans Wilson and Associates. There's been a motion and a second to approve the approval of the change order number two to amendment number three of the master agreement yeah. for, uh, to Hans Wilson and Associates of Fort Myers. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> I should probably be stating who is actually... Well, Karen can see, I think, who is... She can probably watch it on the video. Yeah, yeah. It's the same it. two people every time. 
It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> it's always <laughs> Lynn and can tell who is actually saying the, um, the motion is second, so. Okay, uh, we'll move then on to uh, Award of Agreement number four to Corolla Engineers. Lene <coughs> and Heinen Procurement, for the record, uh, on, dis on November 20th, 2019, council, council awarded a master agreement to Corolla Engineers for the public water supply master agreement. In that master agreement, we previously negotiated hourly rates for future specific authorizations. Staff requested a proposal from Corolla engineers uh, to assist the city with implementation of the Southwest Florida Water Management District accepted Wellfield Management Plan, assess closeout requirements for the city's Florida Department of Environmental Protection, underground injection control permit, and development of a site-specific groundwater flow model for additional analysis and evaluation of future well field operation. This is a lump sum agreement in the amount of $88,233. Staff recommends award of amendment number four to Carrillo Engineers of Sarasota, Florida. Discussion. Mm -mm. <clears throat> I'll move approval of the award of amendment number four to Corolla Engineers. Second. Okay. Oh. <laughs> there was a, a, a motion and two seconds. John and Jaha both seconded it. Um, the approval of the award of amendment number four to Corolla Engineers. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Now we move on to the next item, item 4C, resolution approving the <coughs> execution and delivery of a loan agreement. Yes, and this is a resolution which I'll read by title only. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, the City, approving the form and authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement by and between the City and Regions Capital Advantage, Inc., subject to the parameters set forth in this resolution authorizing and approving the issuance of a note by the city in connection with said loan agreement relative to the refinancing of the city's revenue note series 2012 issued to refinance various public works projects within the redevelopment area of the city in accordance with the 1990 Punta Gorda downtown redevelopment plan pledging designated revenues to repay the note covenanting to budget and appropriate from legally available non ad valorem revenues of the city in the event designated revenues are insufficient to pay debt service of the note, authorizing the proper officials of the city to do all other things deemed necessary or advisable in connection with the loan agreement, interlocal agreement, and said revenue note, and providing an effective date. Kristen Simeone, Finance Director. Um, so you'll recall at the last um, April 1st meeting, we had kind of brought this as a um, possibility that we were looking into refinancing the debt service. There has been a lot of volatility in the market, so we had pulled it at the time because indications were we might not get the savings we were thinking we were going to get. Um, however, we continued to work with um, one of our other lenders and um, was able to come up with um, a uh, a loan agreement or a lender agreement showing um, with a lower interest rate around the rate we were thinking and that would save interest over the life of the loan um, $565,000 or approximately 4.62% um, on the loan. All the terms are the same as our existing um, loan in that the length of the term is still the same. There's no prepayment penalties. Um, so basically, we're just saving um, the interest expense over that time. Any questions? Questions? I think it's great. So this is a little better <laughs> deal than last week, two Much. weeks ago. Yeah. Much. Yeah, how many banks were, did you actually? Um, we went through, um, we just worked with our current lenders. So okay. um, it, it, SunTrust was the existing lender. And then we went with Regions, who had our last Loan. Oh, I see. Um, okay. We have our bond council and our um, financial advisor available to answer questions. We would just call them if you have any questions. I do have a question. 
Um, is there any penalty by leaving the old financing pr um, project moving it into the new financing project? No, so there were new, no prepayment penalties um, starting January 1, 2020 with that um, financing. So there's so no, there's no downside, is, that's, that was my question. Okay, yes. great. This is a great benefit. It really Good helps job. us reduce our obligation from the general fund as well. I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution approving the, the form and authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement by and between the city and Regents Capital Advantage, Inc. Second. <laughs> All right. We have, we have a resolution. We have our fun where we can. <laughs> Debbie, one of these days you're going to jump in here. Oh, no. <laughs> A, uh, a motion and a second to approve a resolution of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda approving the form of capital authorization of uh, the loan. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Good job. All right, the last one, the CAFR. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> So we have our audited financial statements. Um, they are available online um, for anyone to review. Um, it's for the uh, fiscal year that ended September 30th, 2019, otherwise known as our fiscal year 19. Um, there really were no, we were issued a clean opinion by the auditors. Um, we did show an increase in our net position overall, basically in um, capital improvements. So um, that's a good thing. And any, I'll take any questions you might have about it, or. <laughs> well, we normally have a lot of celebration when we get the I know, opinion, we do. <laughs> and, and the auditors are here, and it's it's a, a great occasion. And I know how proud that uh, Dave Drury, our, um, <laughs> yeah. was on when we would get the CAFR approved, and it's actually quite a, a hefty document. It is. And, I and do it's have got a, a lot of really here. good content. Yes. All right. Big, big thing. There Don is, is holding one up uh, for you to see. Right. It's good reading, um, and the plot is really fascinating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a ch and there's a chase scene at the end, right? <laughs> so we're, we're very excited. And again, I have to thank my staff for putting it together, especially um, Richard Branch. He's, he did a lot of the lead on um, putting it all together as far as um, the document. And okay. Linda Fanstill also for, she, she puts, takes all our Excel documents and gets it into Word and things like that. So it's a, well, it's I a know lot of work. What, um, it is a lot of work. Um, your te team jockeying around with all those spreadsheets and, and really making it all happen. Yeah. Um, so congratulations to your team. Thank you. On um, a job well done. So okay. um, we, we need to have a motion to approve the accept. Is it accept, accept the CAFR or <laughs> approve it or? Yeah. I, I guess they've always called to approve approval. the city's comprehensive annual financial report. You almost stepped on my big moment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For 2019. Okay. <laughs> Second. There's been a motion to approve uh, the city's comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended September 30th, 2019. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Yes, congratulations, and thank you for doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, unfinished business. City manager recruitment process and timeline update. This side or that side? Um, over here. We have the uh, show. Good morning, Council. For the record, I'm Phil Wickstrom, HR manager. Um, I don't know if I need to raise this again. Can you hear me okay? I mean, it's all the crowd. It's not appearing on Karen's screen. Uh -uh. It's very soft. The, the chart is not appearing on Karen's screen, so I can't see it. Can you see it? I can huh? see it. I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, why don't you take my copy? As the coronavirus has bitten and taken hold, um, Howard and I began discussing. Want to go to the other one? The mic. Because that seems to be the mic that causes some problem. I don't know why. 
Is it the phone, maybe? The phone is right by the microphone. Um, I don't know. Is the phone always there? No. I don't know. The phone is, is that your... phone that's sitting there, Howard, that's causing the problem? That's, I think that may be what's causing it. It might be some feedback from it. Is there somebody on? No. No, but it was just maybe that's... That might be better. It probably was maybe giving maybe some that feedback. Was it. I mean, you You're want to try get it your again? steps in today, Phil. Okay. <laughs> we'll find out. Do you have a cell phone in your pocket? No, I do not. I left it in my No, I had wine in my pocket. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, when as the coronavirus began to, began to make itself intrusive, um, Howard and I discussed the possibility of uh, moving the recruiting and interview and all that back a little bit. Right now we are dead on schedule. Um, we've shut down the uh, online portal. We have, um, as I said earlier, we ha or as I said in the email, we, ha we had one that had withdrawn. We had another one withdraw over the weekend. Um, and that's going, to be so that's going to be a risk we will run. Now the two that have withdrawn were both highly qualified. But most of these candidates, this is not the only job that they've applied for. It's fairly common in this business for there to be applicants, same applicant, four or five different cities. It's not uncommon. Um, as we move forward, my recommendation to you would be to move things forward basically a month. Everything that was supposed to happen at the end of May we move to the end of June. Now, the only thing that does is it, it shortens the time frame that a candidate, if currently employed, would be able to give notice to their current employer. One of the things that is absolutely part and parcel of the business is that many times when a council, when a, when a city manager even, they even find out that he's looking or she is looking, they fire him. It happens. If you don't want to be here, don't be here. Um, in this particular case, we we thought it would be best to offer them the opportunity to give as much notice as we could. And the reason for that is um, there's a lot of loose ends to tie up. You know, as he is here for the last few weeks, and if the new person is around, or even if not, there's still loose ends that need to be tied together. So that's going to that will give the the successful candidate a chance to do that. Uh, everything else will pretty much stay the same. There will be a special call meeting on 624, I believe. Um, that would be for the um, group interview with the candidates. In other words, the five of you interviewing each candidate that has been through the round robin the previous day. All right. Um, no decision will be made that day, uh, or it will be made that day. But um, what we are, what I'm intending is that. Um, excuse me. Let me back up. It did. Ch I had to change it a little bit. Um, if we do the final interviews on the 24th, then on 7-1, which is regularly, uh, which is a regularly scheduled council meeting, um, you can discuss and rank the candidates. They won't be here. You'll just go through it. Um, and then you, you would need to authorize me to go ahead and move forward with background check and, and that kind of thing. A big decision you know, we will have to make, and it's a financial decision, is do we, want to, do we want to background check three people, two people, or do we want to background check just your number one and if that person declines or is unable to reach a negotiated contract, we can then spend the extra 2100 on the next one. But that just drags it out further because he needs two weeks. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, it, timing is an issue, and he and the gentleman that uh, that is doing the backgrounds for us that we've agreed with um, has said he needs two weeks. He said whether you give me two or three or one, it's still going to be two weeks by the time I do everything that I have to do. Um, then um, on the 20th, um, 
whoever you identify as the negotiator will be will meet with the city manager or the new city manager candidate and negotiate a contract. You'll have 11 days to do that. It's a little shorter than I would like, especially if it's somebody that's out of state, not around here, and it's everything by phone, by email, by, it just takes more time. It's more difficult to reach a negotiated settlement. We were fortunate with Howard because he was just down the road and he could come up and meet with Larry who happened to be the negotiator for that. Um, and then uh, in the second meeting, is that the second meeting, 819, Howard? Only one meeting? Okay, that would be the 19th. Um, you'll present the, con con whoever negotiates will present the contract to council and we'll formally announce who the new city manager will be. All contingent on reaching agreement with your first candidate. Now, if it, you know, so it, it's just, it really is a touch and go deal. Now, um, whether the current city manager is willing to stay for an additional week, two weeks, whatever, if we are not able to reach agreement on the first candidate, um, I, I'm not certain he would have a problem with that, but I'm not going to speak for him on that issue. That's, that's his decision. So, a um, couple of suggestions as we go through. First of all, as you're shortlisting, you're going to take all this input. You're going to have your one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews. You're going to have the interviews from the panel. I'm recommending that we break the panel in two into nine and nine. The reason for that is if there's uncertainty as to social distancing, it's a whole lot easier to facilitate that than to try and do it with 18 people in the room. The other issue to consider with that group is to make sure they still want to do it. There may be some who are saying, no, I'm not leaving my house. All right, I, we don't know if everything's so uncertain right now. So uh, with your permission, I will contact each of these individuals let them know we're moving things out a little bit and see if they are still interested in participating. If they are not, we'll let you know immediately and then you can uh, talk to some other candidates. Does that sound fair? Yeah. I, think, I think this is very good because, I mean, we wouldn't want anyone to have to, you know, right now their attention is going to be on whatever city they're in right now to yeah. kind of get through this. So I think we want to, you know, in our case, we want their undivided attention. We, we need to be more out of the woods than we are right now. Yeah. Um, there's just too much uncertainty. Um, as we get into taking all this input into consideration, a suggestion I would make as far as coming up with a final five, seven, whatever number you settle on, um, do like you do when you're appointing members of your committees. Find, in other words, Councilmember Miller, you would rank yours one through ten, or you know whatever, and each one would do the same, and then we'd find the commonalities, and that would be your pool. All right, and you will find that there's going to be five or seven in that group, and you may have discovered it already. They're kind of rising to the top, but in this case, you'll have a pretty good idea as to what you want, who you want included. All right, so if we do it in that way, it will be a consensus exercise and you'll come up with, and, and it may be that maybe one person feels very strongly about that and can convince the others, but that is a way I would recommend that you get to the final five or seven, however many you want. Mm -hmm. All right, I wouldn't go beyond seven. It becomes extremely unwieldy, and, uh, but that, again, it's your call on that. Um, if you wish, as you're going through the candidates, um, I can put together some type of a simple scoring sheet that takes into account various considerations, how many years on the job, how many years on the same job. Uh, we have a couple in here that the longest they stayed was two or three years, and they just keep bouncing. Um, now, they may be highly qualified, and in one case, he's extremely well qualified. But the longest he ever stayed any place in the last, I think, 10 or 15 years was like three years. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. And so, you know, in, in my mind, stability is a huge factor mm -hmm. in, in your deliberations. So if you wish, I can send you 
an idea for some type of a, a simple score sheet that enables you any type of score sheet is is subjective to an extent but some of it's very objective how many you know do they have a master's a doctorate a bachelor's um, those can be scored I think veterans the city manager has built a culture here of respecting and recruiting veterans we feel that's important so as, as we if you want to put that down as a, as a you may have two people who are identically qualified you like the look of both resumes or applications one's a veteran one is not my rec, my suggestion to you would be to consider the, the veteran or you can do both all I'm saying is that veterans um, if we're going to use a score sheet veterans are required to get extra consideration you do realize that when you do that, you're excluding women 90% of the time. Well, in that, we have to walk a fine, you know, we have, a, I think we have a very diverse pool right now, the way it, it stands. I do too, but if we're going to only look at veterans, no, then we're, not we're eliminating only look, women. I'm not I'm only, just, I'm just okay. mentioning that, Phil. Yes. And I apologize for arguing at that point. It, It is a difficult, we are veterans' preference organization we are also an EEO organization um, and those have legal meaning within the context of what we're going through right now um, if you run into two candidates that you feel the same about one's female the other one's a veteran bring them both in I mean, it doesn't hurt it just um, and if you want me to leave the veteran off of there, then the legal requirement to have an extra score for being a veteran is moot because we're not using that as a scoring mechanism. So I, but I, I would, I would strongly encourage that we, um, that we consider veterans. And uh, as I'm looking through there in the top 19, I think there's 19 that were what I consider a tier one. There were maybe a couple of veterans, but not, not very many. It was pretty. Anyway, I, I, in fact, I don't even remember one. Anyway. I think it could be helpful to have um, <clears throat> some criteria that we could, um, that would, might help guide us through this. Yeah. Um, we all, each of us might have our own thoughts as mm -hmm. to kinds of things. I've been taking notes mm -hmm. about certain things that I'm, uh, interested in um, mm -hmm. and and finding or not finding mm -hmm. um, and so um, and whether or not I feel that they're a one uh, it, it, as well yeah and, and, so and that's I, that's why uh, I gave you all, all 50 well and I, I actually uh, and I know you gave us at one point in time you gave us the other resumes I'd like to see some of those other resumes that are in the tier I, two I have I think they're all there they're are all they there, all there? Yeah. Yeah. oh I did one yes I I couldn't find them. I couldn't find them. They're all the way, generally, yes. they're all. I, yeah, I put them all in a folder, and I have, I think I have 55. But now two of them have withdrawn, so. Yeah. But I think I got um, a total of 55. I can, can, I can resend Yeah, them? I can resend the, okay. the resumes, um, DD-214, if they're a veteran. Um, well, I don't but those think docs, I need to see DD-214. Uh, yeah, I don't think we need yeah. that. If they just said I'm a veteran, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, to help us, I know scoring-wise, coming up with some kind of a way to help uh, us uh, do a little ranking so that we can come up with our top numbers okay. so that it makes it maybe it will make us a, a little easier mm -hmm. um, yeah I'd like to see the a ranking place for if they are experienced as a city manager and if they have certification uh, yes. I, that was exactly what I, I was just gonna say I think there's four that are ICMA credentialed three or four oh I but but just the fact that they had the title of city manager is is a, okay. I think a criteria we should include on that. We'll, we'll add, put that in as Absolutely. an extra score. Thank um, you. The other thing, I, as I looked at, I, I agree with I, I'm agreeing with the um, postponing this. Yeah. Um, I would like to see us consider uh, on June 25th instead of the first meeting in in um, July on July the first because the previous calendar. We were actually going to be um, interviewing people on the 20s. Interview, interviewing on the 7th or 8th. We were going to be 
we were going to be making these a uh, decision right away, like the next day, I believe. Yes. I would like to see us um, get together the next day when it's fresh on our minds, okay. as opposed to waiting a week. I would too. All right. Because Agreed. I think, it, and if we do it at a special meeting, it will give us more focus on that topic alone. It's such an important topic. And only that topic. And, and, and only that topic. And only that topic. Yeah, because yeah, otherwise, if we put it in a, in a council meeting, it's amongst everything else, and uh, we may not do it justice. Okay. Um, and I, um, and I, I think doing it when it's fresh in our minds, it will be help us. I agree, and also we, we go on break shortly after that, so I want to make sure that's all done and out of the way so the city staff can do their thing while we are on break if necessary. If there has to be an emergency meeting called for any reason, we can always do that, but Absolutely. get it done before we do our summer break. I guess at this point I would ask the city manager if, if, um, if there's an issue with the the hiring process and we need a couple of extra weeks is the city manager willing to it's also a possibility that we could have um, somebody be a stand-in you know um, so acting, acting. again uh, I've been flexible and if, and if I need to stay a few more weeks I stay a few more weeks I mean it, I'm, I'm not going anywhere so yeah, your um, cruise is canceled <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah, whatever works. Okay. Whatever works. Okay, okay. good. Right. Yeah, I get, thank you. Great. I get, given the circumstances here, we're trying to be as flexible, flexible, accommodating as we can, and yet get the job done because mm -hmm. uh, it's an important. Well, and if they're being watched as carefully as you say they are when they apply, we owe it to them, yeah. I think, to. I will say, act. though, that, you know, um, thinking back on the day that I got a phone call from Howard that said he was. Um, he was, uh, what, uh, one of three that were being considered for a city manager job in Aiken, South Carolina. Um, this was a number of years ago. I remember that. And it's like my heart sank. My yeah. first, you know, my first reaction was, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then after uh, it, it settled, you know, for a few minutes and, and talking with Howard, it, to me it came and said, well, it's an opportunity. And you know it, it is. It's always an opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, not to look at it as a as a negative. Um, and so I think um, that yes, there may be um, cities that get angry with somebody for. <laughs> but you know, hey, um, I guess I can see why somebody would want to leave that city then. <laughs> yeah. but, and and we, you know, we're not we're not like that. So. This is a collegial body compared to some councils and yes. commissions. Yes. And um, I've read, we have, between Courtney and, and me, we have <clears throat> spent hours pouring through Google, through Facebook, through other social, me social media platforms. And there are some city managers that have just been done wrong. All right. But it, it's the nature of the politics in that community. It, it. There's been some interesting things that <laughs> that are available on social media yeah. and internet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and so we are. Um, Howard has a phrase that I like very much. They most of them look good, on paper. Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> that's always the problem. And, and so we, you know, but we're trying to be as thorough as we can in providing you information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to confirm we're going to move um, the items that are on the 7-1 regular call meeting. We're going to move bo both of those. So there's three things. You're going to do council conduct final interviews. Then you're going to immediately rank there after they'll leave. They'll go travel, what, whatever they're going to do. And then you'll authorize me to begin the background check using our uh, the paid professional that does that. That correct? Um, well, be on 624. Uh, do you want to make it 625? No. Well, originally the. So are you talking about moving the July 1 date back to June 25th? Then is that what we're talking about? Well, um, June 24. Well, okay. June 24th, we're doing final interviews with each candidate. In in open oh, session. I see. I see what you're saying. Back on two, 528, we were going to do it all in one day. And so what you have done in the new schedule 
is you had split that up so yes. that it was happening part on the 24th and part on June, yes. July 1st. So do you feel that we can do it all on the 24th then? It's going to be the freshest. Worst comes to worst, we'll do, we'll, you'll do the on banc interviews and then come back on the 25th to make your decision and... <clears throat> and so actually doing the ranking on the 25th? The 24th. The, well, yes, the ranking would be on the 25th, and then... Um, so you, moving that bullet that says council ranks... So the 24th would be that. a special meeting, and this is all we would be doing at that meeting. Is that correct? Well, if I'm, what I'm hearing now is um, they're moving what is under... Uh, on this spreadsheet... If you look July at the red, stri red strike throughs, so that's the original schedule. So moving what was uh, on the alternate schedule for July the 1st and move that also up to June 24th as well. Because that originally we were going to do all of it on May 28th. So why, why should we not just do it all on June the 24th then? Yeah, that's not a regular city council day, no, so, um, yeah, so that would be June 17th is the second council meeting in June. So this would be, these would all be individual separate meetings yes. aside from city council meeting. Mm -hmm. So you're saying just do um, all of the stuff that's listed under June 24th and July 1 on June 24th? Yes. Okay. On the same day. 24th day. Yeah, it was originally going to happen on the same day anyway. So we would do the final interviews maybe in the morning and then do the ranking in the afternoon or yeah. something along those lines? Yeah, and okay. it really is going to depend on how many, yeah. right? Yeah. And how long each one takes <coughs> with the five of you. I have to have a lunch break and come back and finish yeah. the interviews. Or if the worst comes to worst, you do all the interviews one day and then the next day you come back and rank, rank. them. Do we have that, to notice that? Yeah, they would have to be noticed. I think, is it 24 hours in advance? Yeah. It would have to be noticed. Okay, so we could notice that special meeting if we felt like that was what was going to need to happen. So we have to notice two special meetings. The 24th is special, mm -hmm. and then if you decide to come back on the 25th okay. to do the actual rankings and, and those items, that would be fine. Well, I'm good with this. Do it all, do it all, it all on, the on the 24th if it's yeah. possible. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. As long as we could do it in the morning and the afternoon, because I want to have a little bit of time yeah. to digest the stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just. To... You don't want us to bring your food and let you sit right there and okay, okay. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Thank you anyway. <laughs> um, all right. So that's what we'll plan to do. Um, do you need to know now how many people you want us to interview, or do you no, want us to? No. I would rather you go through your process of reviewing the applications. Okay. And then when, when it comes time, we've got, uh, right now you have until, you have until June 17th to confirm applicant, no, I'm sorry, Let's see. June 3rd. No, you have until June 3rd, so you've got six weeks to go through everything. And... I might be able to get through all of them by then. It is taking so long. Is there anything that we as, we as staff can do to help with that? or um, It just takes a, it takes time to sit yeah. and read through. And, I, and what I'm trying to do is go through and look on the Internet to see what kind of information is available on each candidate as I'm doing it. So yeah. it's taking a long time. I mean, it's taking upwards of 45 minutes to an hour for each one if you really do it thoroughly. So... Mm -hmm. okay. It's, yeah, it's yeah. not a short slam bam. I'm gonna run, just gonna breeze through these. It's not that kind of a process. Mm -hmm. John? Yes, are you're gonna ask for references, and that yeah. those will those be are, forthcoming. Those are already out there. We have asked. They they each submitted up to five, and we're just asking for three from from them. Um, it's very rare that a, that a reference is going to give a bad reference yeah. for somebody right. that they've selected. Um, but at least you'll get a feel, you know, and there's some that have, well, I don't know the guy that well. Why did he give me as a reference? I've never had somebody that I use as a reference without me calling and saying, right. I'm using you for a reference. Mm -hmm. um, it appears that that's been the case in some of these. And that's... Are you making you, a note of that you for also, us? <laughs> you also asked where you might help uh, this searching through the internet. 
I know some people love to do that. And well, Courtney's, are, it, Courtney's already been doing that. But if there is some information that comes out of that, that would be we'll useful. We'll put that to together. Well, it's on the yeah. thing. It says, you know, LinkedIn. Well, that's that. that's very that's minimal. A, that's just one. Uh, Courtney has been looking at all of the social media yeah. site, major social media sites. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been a couple where I'll, I'll be walking by and she'll say, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's So right. she she's yeah. she's making, she is making notes. That would be useful we to know. Yeah. We want the dirt. Yes. You want the dirt? Yeah. Well. Or if a, someone's uh, been wronged. I know several said they were fired because they were looking for a job. There yeah, and that, and that yeah. happens. It happens. Uh, okay. But I, I got to tell you, and Howard's heard me say this a gazillion times, the truth is in the middle. The person can say they fired me because I was looking for another job. There's something else driving yeah. mm -hmm. that, right. that they fired that person right away. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's grain of salt type stuff. Yeah. And we also know that there are sometimes situations where somebody just gets sideways with someone. Yeah. And it's just... Well, and you've got... It's a spiral, even though the rest of the council might think they're... Yeah, and you've got some communities I've noticed, and a few of them, like a new city council came on board, or a new mayor, a new strong mayor comes in, and they want a clean house, or they're not happy with this person or another person, and so things all all get twisted sideways, and that's unfortunate for some people. They get caught in the middle. Well, uh, see the South, or there's a city in South Carolina where the city manager had been there for 17 years, I think, and got kicked to the side because. He blew the whistle on what he thought was inappropriate activity, and um, then they decided that he was inappropriate activity. <laughs> so, um, okay, we'll get. I, I'll we'll put together the information we, that she has found, that and I, my notes include some of that stuff uh, in the spreadsheet that I send you. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, there are some that. I'm not certain they'd be a good cultural fit for the way we do business, um, but again, this, this it's your call. So. Well, the way they answered the question, some of them have answered the questions. Is is telling? It is. Yeah. Very. Yes. Yeah. You can tell if they communicate well or if they have had the experience we're we're looking for, and yeah. you know crisis management situations and things of that type too. But. Well, and I think that, you know, we we have a job description and it's very clear in the job description about how community oriented we are and how empowering and all these other things. And when you get some of these people, it's, it's like they're just so singularly focused on certain things that it's it's almost like, whoa. Yeah. <clears throat> Howard set the bar pretty high. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Just a, a suggestion before you formally accept the, the recommendation for the timeline. On the uh, the meeting that uh, you're planning on having on the 24th with the option to go to the 25th, it would be my recommendation, um, just for a procedural perspective, to notice it for two days. But if you don't need the second day, then you just simply say, oh, we don't need it. Good suggestion. Thank, Thank you. That was so a, I didn't know if that was allowed. Idea. Yeah, that's okay. that's fine. Then we okay. don't have to s schedule an emergency meeting okay. or something. Yeah. So we've got it if we need it. Mm -hmm. If we all at that point in, in time we said, you know what, we need a little more time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was very pleased with the response to our advertisement. It, mm -hmm. I, I really mean it. It it goes from Maine to, I think, New Mexico, to Washington State, California, a couple in the Midwest around Chicago. I mean, it's just amazing how <laughs> it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the two that we lost, one was from uh, uh, Estero. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was qualified. Huh? He was very qualified. Yeah, one was from Estero, and the other very one, um, yeah, he was young. And the other one, um, I'm going to say from the East Coast, Carolina, Ho Ho Holloman, Holloway. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, um, young is good if they if they're the right person. Right. right. And that also means they could have longevity, which is also good. Mm -hmm. 
or they might might not. I mean, that's that's, that's the yeah, other consideration. Yeah. But I'm I'm not going to tell you the age of these people. You can you know so you can figure out just you by can. googling them. Quite frankly, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so are we okay with what I have put together? And yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yep. Okay. Do we, we need any kind of a special approval or just a consensus? I just consensus. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then my next step will be we'll notify all the candidates that are left mm -hmm. um, of these changes because they've already seen the original schedule. So we will send them the changes, basically telling them we're pushing it a month out. Uh, take a look at your calendars and make sure you're going to be available these days. And we're also authorizing you to contact all of the people that are in the community group because I know I've been getting questions from mm -hmm. people. Yeah. You know, and they're interested. I, I haven't had anybody that's contacted me that wants out. That wants out. No. They just yeah. they just want to know what we're going to do. Yeah. Well, um, I, I am a little. The only concern I have is breaking the citizens group into two groups. That means it's a whole another interview for every candidate. And I I just this is my concern from the beginning. If you remember correctly, I said it needs to be one group because I know it's a big group, but it needs to be one group so there's only one interview per candidate for each you know, for each of that. I, I just think that's, it's overwhelming. I just think every candidate is going to be very intimidated by that. It's, it's enough just. room in here, I suppose, that we could. We could, we might be able to set it up in set here. Set it up so that you have. Yeah. Social distancing and. Yeah. The pressure of presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, and I do think that's the better way to do it. Personally, that's just my preference. Mm -hmm. All right. I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you look like you. Well, I was trying to think. We did two for the police chief. We did the business mm -hmm. people and we did the community people, and I didn't feel like there was any. Actually, the group that I was a part of was a mix of business and. But those candidates did not meet with the city council members one on one oh, either. Oh, they didn't? No. no. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. No, we were not right. a part of it. Fully different process. We just kind okay. of observed. Okay. Yeah, we were just observers. Yeah, then one's probably plenty if they're going to meet with yeah, us. Yeah, so they only did basically, well, three interviews. There were three three groups. Okay. Four, I'm sorry, Howard Howard had one. There were two, two citizens groups here. There was the police department and then um, Howard. Okay. Yeah, there were four, for the police chief interviews, there were four Yeah, groups. yeah. yeah. Um, but that was, was it. So there were four interviews. Four. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. That's fine. I, believe me, 18 people. Well, it, it'll it'll show how they can communicate with Absolutely. with people that are going to be the residents they're going to be dealing with every single day. And Howard can attest to <laughs> how much fun that can be sometimes. Will it, Phil, will it give the individual people with eighteen people in the room enough time to ask questions? Wait, will everybody get a question? Um, eighteen people. Um, I'll be real blunt with you. There may be some in that 18 that don't want to ask questions. They just want to kind of oh. watch and observe. Well, did, oh. but didn't I, we say that you were going to kind of facilitate yeah, those we're gonna, groups? We're going to try and keep that moving. We, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it, and I'm not going to provide the questions to them. All right. Yeah. They're going to come up with their own. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, okay, I'll take question one. You take two. I, I, I like on, I like spontaneity. I want there to be, a question may lead to a five-minute answer. Another question may lead to a 30-second answer. Yeah. I just think we need to be careful that if everybody does want to participate, that they get to feel like they did. Okay. That's all I'm Maybe saying. they each submit a question in writing and Phil reads random questions if for each candidate. That might be yeah. a way to do yeah. it. Okay. That would be a great okay. way to do it, yes. Okay. Any other comments? Did we forget anything? No. Deb. Good discussion. Um, if, we, if we know what the direction is, if you can uh, I'll get forward this. those resumes again. Yep. Okay, uh, we'll move on then to placement of speed limit signs in burnt store aisles. Here comes the, here here comes comes. the PGPD. <laughs> you go there. Uh, He's going to hit that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Chief Pam Davis, Punta Gorda Police Department. Um, so we're getting ready to talk about the speed limit signs in Burnt Store Isles. Um, this, I meet with them pretty much monthly. If it's not me, it's Lieutenant DeVault or uh, Captain Nara. So, um, and and every month we are, and I, I think the letters were read into the record, but we, we talk about the traffic issues there, the, the thought of speeding and 
and on different roadways. So we've done a lot of traffic enforcement, um, have had the radar trailer out there as well. I've personally gone out there with Lieutenant DeVault and did radar ourselves just to see what kind of problem we do have. Mm -hmm. And it is. And one of the residents I talked to was talking about how they were followed um, pretty closely. And he, he said, I was doing the speed limit, which was 35. And I said, no, the speed limit is 30. <laughs> so um, we, we did put speed limit signs in PGI, and we think it curbed a lot of, of the complaints that we were getting. We know there's still a couple areas that, that still have speeding, and, and Captain Nara has been addressing that. But, uh, but we think this is a good idea. So I actually, uh, Captain Nara was the one that went out in PGI and found all the areas that we wanted to put the signs. So I asked him to take on this project, and he's put together um, some proposed areas of where he thinks the speed limit sign should be. So I'm going to turn it over to Captain Nara. Morning, Captain Nara, uh, Point of Police. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, on a PowerPoint. This is a picture of all of the uh, stop signs and uh, traffic control signs that are in the city limits. As you can notice down south, um, it's in this area, we got very few, and that's the Burnt Store Isles area. Um, so the first one I want to address is Monaco Drive. Um, there are no speed limit signs on Monaco Drive east or west of Madrid Boulevard for traffic turning off of Madrid Boulevard and onto Monaco Drive. And the way I attacked this situation was the same way as PGI um, area. If you're coming in, into off of one main drag onto another, um, it, I think it'd be good to educate because people will think that the speed limit changes. Um, because in the state of Florida, most people think speed limit's 40 unless it's otherwise noted. Um, so basically, if we put a speed limit sign in the area, once again, um, of 606 Monaco Drive, that will be for the westbound traffic, and one out at around 555 Monaco Drive for the eastbound traffic. Anybody coming off of uh, Madrid turning onto Monaco will see a speed limit sign. Um, to address that area. Um, so now you'll have, um, here's a picture of 606 Monaco. As you can see, if someone comes off of Madrid either and heads back towards 41, they will be seeing a uh, speed limit sign immediately. Um, and then if they're coming off Madrid and going into the neighborhood, um, there'll be one right there on the right. Second uh, main street is Tripoli Boulevard. Um, there's no signs north of Monaco Drive, and with the speed limit changing um, between Madrid and Monaco, um, I, I spoke to Dave Myers and Mark Gehring. There's, there's going to have to be a sign there advising of the speed change back to 30 miles an hour. So um, I suggested that we just put it just north of Monaco Drive. Um, they're going to have to have one there anyways to advise the public that it changed back to 30 and a little red dot there that's where i'm proposing it um and of course it's in that area public works would have to figure out where would be the best spot to post it um i looked at macedonia drive there are no speed limit signs on macedonia um so i'm suggesting to uh place one on at 406 macedonia and one 591 macedonia and once again those aren't exact addresses that's just the area that i'm proposing um, as you can see here, um, when someone turns off of Monaco on the Macedonia, they're going to see there'll, there'll be a speed limit sign right there. And then because Macedonia is a little longer street, um, I propose to put one right here so that people coming around the corner here, if, in case they forget, it's, uh, it's in plain view. Um, and I looked at Madrid Boulevard. Um, there's only the speed limit sign on Madrid Boulevard near Tripoli for uh, people going into the neighborhood. Um, I suggest that we put one on 508 uh, Madrid and one at 437 Madrid. And this would be for all the traffic that's turning off Monaco. Um, as you can see, this, this main drag here is Monaco Drive. Um, if someone uh, is coming down Monaco and decides to take a uh, right on Madrid to head towards Publix. There'll be a sign right there um, advising them of the speed limit. And the same if they um, going into the neighborhood, there'll be a sign right there. Um, and this way there'll be, it's, um, there are seven total signs. The one on 
Triple E, I'm not really counting because we have to have that because of the speed change. So there's a total of six signs I'm proposing, and that will hit every main drag. And no matter what main street you're turning off of onto another main street, there'll be a sign. And, of course, I mean, we could place more signs if you like. I'm just trying to keep everybody happy. I know we've had uh, a lot of people come to us telling us they love the signs. I've had a couple people come to the station saying uh, they don't want them, so I'm trying to keep everybody happy and just putting the signs where we feel would educate the public the most. Questions? Uh, no question. Uh, just a comment. Um, again, thank you for being proactive on this. Um, you know, I, I spoke to several of the folks at the police department a year or so ago when we talked about putting them back in PGI. Um, you know, an unintended consequence of removing the signs due to sign blight several years ago by a previous council ended up in problems with speeding. And, and this, my, my mantra has always been public safety is paramount. And, um, and I think this is going to help a lot. I, I read constantly on social media issues about the uh, Madrid and Monaco intersection and people speeding through there and not stopping for stop signs. And so speed limits signs will definitely, I think, hinder some of that. It's not going to fix all problems, but I do think that um, being proactive about this is definitely the way to go, and I totally support this. So thank you for being proactive. So if I can just make a few comments since it's in my hood. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I attend the, the BSIA mm -hmm. monthly meetings as well. Um, and um, they do, they deliberate on, on speed issues constantly. I have, tr have really tried um, to come up, be creative on mm -hmm. what they can do. Um, the the um, question that I have here, and I really appreciate that really coming up with some suggestions. Um, one of the items on here was um, a comment from a resident was if there is a vacant lot next to a residential where there's a house, um, is it better to put that in the vacant lot so that we're not having to have it in someone's yard, right. so to speak? So and, um, yes. realizing, though, that if a house gets built there, you're probably going to have <laughs> to move it anyway because this construction would, you know. Um, exactly. And, I, and Captain Arthur, when he put all this together, it was just he just picked areas. So if there's a vacant lot closer to that area, that's, that's not an issue. Yeah. The other one... Uh, a discussion item was the fact that um, the length of, of uh, Macedonia is about the same length as Tripoli from uh, Monaco all the way to the end of Tripoli. And there's a sign at the beginning of Tripoli, but there is no sign um, mm. for people coming back out on Tripoli. It's a good point. So there was um, a discussion to consider some sign maybe around Cassandra or something um, where um, people coming out would see a sign. Okay, I, I looked at that, and um, mm -hmm. I think maybe a good possibility would be around Andorra for people exiting the neighborhood. You're, you're, because you're that would be about, this. yeah, that would be about... Um, They're not that far apart. No, no, no and Cassandra, Cassandra is actually half halfway. It's six-tenths of a mile either way, so we could put it on, on whatever side you choose. Um, for people, you're talking about people just coming out of the... Yeah, they're just saying that, you know, people coming <laughs> coming out need to see that it's 30. Um, I mean, I ride my, my recumbent trike around the, the neighborhood, and it's really obvious when you see somebody zooming by as opposed to somebody going slower. Um, and, and I can't say that it's always construction-related. It's a mix. Um, some of it's residents. Some of it's <laughs> residents, absolutely. Um, and so, and, and I will tell you a lot. A lot is, as we found from, as the chief said, people who know speed limit is, we, we have people from all over the country. And I know Ohio, there is no thirty mile an hour. It's either twenty five or thirty five. So when you're going through residential mm -hmm. neighborhoods, mm -hmm. people driving down from from Michigan or Ohio or somewhere, and they're like, you know, they, they just automatically, if mm -hmm. they don't see a speed limit sign, they just assume, oh, it's thirty five miles an hour, like it is in the state they come from. So I think just by Educating them when they're uh, coming in and going out would uh, help out a lot. Yep. So, so we'll add the sign on to. We could do Cassandra. Yeah, it's and there was also just a question, and with all respect <coughs> of your um, judgment, that um, San Massimo is is uh, quite a, a lengthy area. I didn't know. Um, 
a lot of people coming out of San, that San Massimo area onto Macedonia. And so, but they said, you know, we can go with this. And certainly if you feel like you need to do something more later, you can. Yeah. So. I mean, we could add one on San Massimo. If it does speed limit sign that we are putting on Macedonia, turning um, onto Macedonia off Monaco mm -hmm. is 0 0.2 tenths of a mile um, from where we would put one on San Massimo. And San Massimo is, I believe, we, I, we measured it out yesterday, it's approximately 0 0.4 tenths of a mile. So if you like a sign there, we, we can, um, you know, like we're, I said. We're just asking questions. It, yeah. it was from some of, like, um, Bill Courtney and some others of the association were just asking well, and discussing uh, And it, we so. looked at some of the past complaints, and we don't, we don't have, have any have complaints any. for that particular road, okay. so we kind of left it alone. Gotcha. Um, but we, what we could do is, like you said, let's do start with the ones that we, have, we have and then add if yep. we, we see, yep. you know. I, I think, we'll, and we'll obviously combine the speed limit signs with officers out there enforcing as well. So we're going to educate and enforce, and I think that'll, hopefully people will start to register. Yeah. Well, I know on my trike, I don't go faster than maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, I think, do we need a... I have one maybe? question. Okay. Howard, the $700 that this is going to cost, is that... We, you said we already had the signs, so $700 is what it costs the city to put a sign in? No. It, no. Uh, fortunately, that's what a sign costs. Fortunately, when we took, when we removed a lot of the signs years ago, um, Public Works did not throw them away. We have uh, enough signs on stock to uh, replace because... The community changes over time, so uh, while we got rid of signs years ago, now they're making a comeback. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, five, ten years from now, we may be removing some and signs. I, I we'll actually see. put that number in there because it, um, Mark Gearing said it's a, actually a $100 sign, and I just said seven times, 100 is 700. He was checking on his stock to make sure we had enough, but just in case, oh, okay. I wanted to have that in there. If we needed to, we could purchase a okay. couple signs. But I, but I think he has enough in there stock-wise. I was just worried that we were going to be billed Not $100. Yet. It was $100 a whole, Right. I didn't, wasn't in favor of that. Okay. I think we should be okay, though. All right, that's all. Thanks. Now, now you had a conversation regarding if police feels that we need to add another sign on another street. Do you want us to come back to you? I feel that if, the, in my opinion, living there, if the police feel like we need one, then let's put one in. I think the association, they could check with the association if they want. And okay. I would defer to the, to the police. Okay. I have no problem with that. I think we need to get it done. Okay. Thank so you do very we much. Need, Thank is, you guys. Do Thank we you. need a consensus or do we need a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the um, the placement of speed limit signs in Burton Store aisles as um, discussed at today's meeting. He seconded. What did you second? Okay. There's been a motion and a second to approve the placement of speed limit signs in Burton Store aisles. All in, fa all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. All right. We can move on to the discussion regarding... Parking on Gill Street. Good morning, uh, Lieutenant Justin Duvall, Honorable Police Department. A um, few weeks back, we had one of our officers confront us with a uh, problem that she noticed while working in detail at the First United uh, Methodist Church. Uh, the address is 507 West Marion. Uh, it's between Olympia and Marion and um, adjacent to Gill Street. Um, she noticed the problem, um, let me back up. Our current city ordinance uh, under uh, chapter 23 uh, does signify some streets that are only one side of the street parking only. Um, Gill Street is not one of those streets at this time. Um, so the problem lies with when uh, First United Methodist Church um, conducts worship services on the weekends. Um, the attendees, along with the residents that live there, uh, that becomes a very high traffic area, and parking on both sides of the street causes a problem with uh, some just through traffic, as well as um, emergency vehicle traffic. 
So uh, as we began looking into this, uh, we had taken some pictures just with our patrol cars and having uh, normal traffic uh, parked in the road and then normal traffic uh, traveling through. Uh, that particular road measures 26 feet wide. Uh, when you have a vehicle parked on both sides of the road, uh, makes it a little cumbersome for just a regular car or truck to pass through, um, especially with uh, emergency vehicles such as a fire truck or an ambulance. While we were conducting this uh, research, uh, we had a, a resident approach us and uh, she indicated that during weekend times, uh, she does notice that when she tries to back out uh, of her driveway when there's cars parked on the west side of Gill Street, uh, the house is on the east side, and then vehicles parked on either side of her driveway uh, becomes very uh, hard to uh, reverse out of her driveway. She's actually resulted to on weekends parking on the street so she doesn't have a problem getting out on the weekends. So uh, we had put this in there just to show that we do have some similar streets, uh, Sullivan Street, Harvey Street, and Gold, uh, Goldstein. Um, they are also 26 feet wide, uh, but only allow parking on one side and then travel on the opposite side. Uh, the proposal um, is for the section of Gill Street between West Olympia and West Marion <coughs> Avenue. Uh, to be added to chapter 23 under traffic regarding parking only one side of the street only on saturdays and sundays from 7 a.m to 5 p.m uh, we added the times and the days so it didn't uh, inconvenience anybody during normal business hours monday through friday um, and the majority of the events from the church are during the weekend times um, by doing so it'll create a safer area for vehicular traffic correct any issues for residents uh, when they're departing their driveways um, as well as open the roadway for emergency vehicles, uh, traffic to flow without obstruction. Chief Pam Davis, Point of Order Police Department. So uh, um, Lieutenant DeVault did speak to Reverend Loomis as well at the, at the church just to get his thoughts on this because obviously it would restrict some of the parking for, for his attendees. And he, he was certainly um, supportive of it and just asked maybe we could limit the parking, um, have no parking on the east side so that they could still park on the west side, which would still give residents an opportunity to be able to pull out of their driveways and be able to um, see and get out easily. So um, we did talk to him as well. Any questions about John or discussion? I thought when we talked about this or that it was the other side of the street you were going to Originally it was. <laughs> and I was like, when, once we talked to Reverend Loomis, it was like, oh, that makes sense. So um, we thought it'd probably be better to do it, to have the no parking on the east side, just to, that way that if there are attendees, they could still park on the west side. Because the main concern for the residents is just that they can't get out of their driveways. So um, it's not that they can't park in front of their driveways or on so the street. there'd be parking on the west side? Correct. Okay. That's the church side? Correct. So then that would end up that having, would be packing out of their out of their driveways that would still be something they should still issue. be able to they still well they should be able to the part the reason they couldn't back out is because there was cars on both sides so they had to fit in that little tiny space to, to get out is that correct yeah uh, it, and it's actually after looking at it and analyzing it, it's the best of both evils because when you have cars on the opposite side at least you can see traffic coming through rather than having a car on either side of your driveway right. and having that obstruction, visually obstruction, mm -hmm. of being able to see what's coming down on the other side of those vehicles. Right. So um, this is probably, when we were looking at it, this is kind of the best of both evils of having, being able to accommodate the church, the residents, and then a safety factor as well. Ben? Um, I'm going to throw something else out there. Um, I, I would like to recommend that we make this all the time, not just Saturdays and Sundays, and I'll tell you why. Um, I spoke to a member of the church who goes to regularly scheduled events at the church, and they said that it is a common problem all the time, not just Saturdays and Sundays, and that it creates a traffic problem on any given day of the week, not just Saturday and Sunday. And secondly, I spoke to one of our police volunteers who drives the route all the time in their car, and, and she reiterated the same situation. She said that there, is, there are several streets in the downtown corridor that have this problem. And I can tell you from personal experience, I've tried to go from um, Olympia to the chamber on Sullivan Street, and I will tell you, people will run you into the, into the curb if they're coming um, southbound on Sullivan Street. They will actually run you into the curb because they want to come through, and that is just, that's not safe. 
That is absolutely not safe. And three weeks ago, I was going to a meeting at the chamber, and I turned on to Sullivan, and there was a car parked on the west side of the street, and there was a delivery truck, a beer delivery truck, parked on the other side of the street, and there was no way a, an emergency vehicle could have made it down that street. I think we need to take a serious look at the whole downtown corridor where we have narrow streets and, and really take a, a more serious approach to this. But for, this, for purposes of today's discussion, I would like to recommend that we do it all the time on Gill Street. Okay. That was actually um, something that I was really thinking the same about uh, because I know that the church is very popular and there are lots of events there. And I wanted to make sure that the residents had were able to find parking and not having problems at other times as well. And I think um, the clarification of the parking uh, makes a lot of sense why you would want it on the west side. It's also, uh, there are no, I don't believe driveways along there. Right, no. So that's gonna allow for a little more parking yeah. rather than Right. in between houses kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that for the residents to be able to see oncoming traffic so they can back out makes a, a lot of sense. Um, so I agree with that. I was going to ask that same question. Was it residents that didn't want it all week or was it just we, this, we were going to Just try thinking this? about the most traveled times and, and really kind of relaying it to when our officers are seeing it. So. Okay. No reason not to, if, if you guys want to do it all the time, that's not an issue. Yeah, we have received some complaints in the past about this specific issue. Mm -hmm. um, this was a little bit more being proactive on one of our officers that was working in detail there. Mm -hmm. When she was making her round, she said, you know, this is kind of an issue and uh, a safety concern and it probably needs to be addressed. And that's how it mm -hmm. uh, became, you know, came to our attention. Yeah, I, I, I ran into the same problem that um, Lynn did with the delivery vehicle at um, on Sullivan, Sullivan. Um, I thought, how am I going to get through here? And I, I did, but it was like... Um, I didn't. I turned around and went to a different intersection to go across. Yeah, so I... It, there's narrow streets, for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that there should only be parking on one side, period. Delivery or what? You should not allow <laughs> obstruction. Uh, we well, is there is there um, a, a criteria that you use for the width of the street for some of these streets? Um, when we were when we were doing the research on it, um, a standard our our vehicles um, are about six and a half seven feet wide. Uh, so a standard vehicle is anywhere from six to eight feet wide. Uh, putting two vehicles side by side on the opposite sides of the street, there's 16 feet of a 26 foot road. So I, I don't think there's a standard. Uh, however, any standard road that we have in the downtown area that are 26 feet wide, really it won't accommodate a car on both sides and then really any car in the middle to where you're not going to mirror off and it just becomes very unsafe. Um, and then especially emergency vehicles. But I mean, like if you had, um, if you currently had a situation on Gill Street where there was a fire and a fire truck and an ambulance had to come down that street and there's parking on both sides, they wouldn't get down that street. Not happening. And, I, and I think we have that same problem on a number of other streets downtown. I'm, it's a concerning thing and I've, I've noticed it more and more as I drive around through the downtown. I did drive down Gill Street and it's, it's like driving, right. bobbing and weaving through a maze and I, I think we definitely need to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay, so for the subject at hand today, <clears throat> do we need to have, um, a vote, or do you want a consensus? A vote? A motion for approval. With the all week. All week. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, there's been a motion and a second to approve uh, the restriction of the parking on Gill Street between Olympia, West Olympia, and West Marion for all the time. All the time. <laughs> um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. May, may I Thank you all. Spend one thing not related to this, but it's related Absolutely. to the other letters. Um, just want to say we will be bringing forward to the council um, soon um, something about about restricting overnight parking. Yeah, because this is an issue as well, but it's not pertaining to this issue. But wanted to make sure that that's this will be forthcoming. That's good. Okay. That's good. Other comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to your team. Um, and for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Thank Stay you. safe. Thank you. All right. We'll take go to recommendations from uh, city officers. And 
the first one um, is we, actually we yeah city manager okay um, before we'll have Ray Briggs our emergency management director come on in so as he's coming in he'll give us a update on the COVID-19 situation while he's coming in the next council meeting May 6th will be uh, we're going to provide you with our FY 2021 uh, strategic plan and action items so you can uh, review that and we'll also have at that same time a budget update as best as we can estimate it as of today so we'll do our best we can but we'll have a budget update at the same time okay. good morning good morning, good morning. Ray Briggs, Fire Chief, for the record. Um, so Howard asked me to give you kind of an update on this whole COVID-19, where we are. Um, it's kind of a mess, isn't it? <laughs> so as a city, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, so I'll kind of start with a few numbers from the Department of Health. Uh, as of this morning, so we had 21,600 uh, confirmed cases in the state of Florida with 571 deaths reported in the state of Florida. Um, Charlotte County, we're at 123 are our current numbers, confirmed positives, and we've had five deaths. You know, that number, again, seems to take a, a day or two to kind of catch up, so ebbs and flows. Um, so, but as a city, how are, how are we doing? And I thought that's where we might go. So, like we, we had a nice write-up in USA Today, and I, I think that article, um, we fared well as a city, um, shed us in pretty good light. Um, one of the statements that we made, we started early in this game as a city, and I really... You know, I wouldn't like to take a lot of credit for that as much as, you know, if you remember back, one of our first cases uh, in the state was in Manatee County. So it kind of put us, uh, made us very aware we got started pretty early in the process. So I think not just as a, you know, first responders, but as a city a, as a whole. So we, we kind of got our act together pretty early and dusted off some plans. I think as Howard said earlier, these are unprecedented times. I've heard it described where we're building the airplane as we're flying it, you know, so there's a lot of. You know, every day brings some new challenges. Um, we continue to participate in daily conference calls um, every day with the local EOC, with our county EOC, state, Department of Health, all of that. So we get some fresh trends and numbers and, and all of that. Um, on those calls, we also hear from our local hospitals. That's a question we get, how are they faring? So the hospital census is doing well. Uh, in fact, in some cases, you know, 60% census, maybe 70% at times. There's ICU beds available. There's ventilators available. We're not in those, you know, scenarios where there's uh, folks who are, you know, that, that are doing without or any of that. So our hospitals are doing well. Um, you know, as a city as a whole, I think we've moved to, we've, we've um, gone into some un uncharted territory when we look at um, our employees working from home, our telework. And I think our latest number was about 40 of our employees or... 46 of our employees, which if you look at not every position in the city is eligible to work from home, right? So, I mean, our folks can't, and there's a lot, of, there's a big number. So if you look at those folks that are truly eligible, and 46 of them are, you know, so it, it's taken some work, but I think on the back side, I, I, I try to, will leave you optimistic in that um, there's some things that we've, we've gone through and that we've learned and that I think we will benefit from on the backside of this, right? So, and I think as a society as well. So one of the uh, comments from the USA Today reporter was how are, you know, are residents, you know, compliant? Are they complying and all of that? And my answer was no, not, not 100%. <laughs> They're not. And I, I think it would be unreasonable to think that everybody's going to. But overall, um, we're, do we're doing okay. Folks are, are, most people are doing the right thing. They really are, and they're taking it serious, and, um, and I think our numbers really reflect that. So we're not going to get 100%, and we realize that. Um, quite honestly, when I leave here and I go and I take Retta and I look at the park and there's folks that are walking, running, biking, whatever, um, it kind of makes me feel good, quite honestly. People are still alive and living and, and living their lives and doing that stuff, and that's okay. All right, they're practicing social distancing. We made it through Easter. We know that many of the faith-based groups, you know, had, um, had got kind of thought outside the box, and they had programs and services in their parking lots and drive-in and that sort of thing. So technology is, is also helping us through this. Um, with that, again, when we compare ourselves to some of our surrounding counties, um, and we do, we communicate. So if you look at uh, your first responders, so um, from our 
our call volume um, from the city fire were down. Actually, our call volume is a little lower than it was this time last year. Oh, so that's encouraging. Um, the acuity of the call is greater. So what's that say? It says that um, folks are maybe, you know, somebody who had a something maybe less emergent that would normally call an ambulance to go. I don't think many people want to go to a hospital these days, right? So they're staying home with some of that. And uh, so call volumes are down, not just for the city, but county, Lee County. We're seeing that all around us. So I, I think that's good. The calls we get, we are running a number of the, you know, uh, COVID type calls, flu-like symptoms, and we've got PPE. We're not in terrible shape. I'll give some um, uh, attaboy to the Department of Health. They've they've helped us with PPE where we've needed it, but we were, again, we started early, so we, we were able to order um, early and get some, get some supplies in. In addition to that, as the article said, we're still using some supplies from the Ebola scare several years ago. We were bright enough to take some of that and, and preserve it, put it away, and um, so it's still there for us today. So we're not in dire straits. I know I speak for the police department the same. The same. So when we go out, we have the right gear. Um, it is interesting that, um, you know, different processes that I wasn't sure we were ever going to get to, right? We're doing today when we talk about, um, you know, a doorway assessment for a patient. I never thought I'd see that, um, but, it, but it does. So there's some processes that we do today that I, I never thought we'd get to, but um, it's going well. Still providing excellent patient care. So I, with that, I'll answer any questions. Anything else I can? Yes, ma'am. One question. Um, Chief, I, I was asked, um, the, the information that's available on the FDOH website, mm -hmm. it shows a map of Florida, then you can click on the county, and then you can also click on a zip code to see how many okay. cases are active in a zip code. Right. Um, However, that still doesn't really tell you how many cases are actually in the city limits because 33950 zip code is um, not all city of Punta Gorda. That's it's correct. Un unincorporated Charlotte County. Do we have an actual number of we, city of Punta Gorda residents? We do, and, and don't hold me to give you an exact number because so that number comes and goes a little bit, right, as people, just because there's a positive, we assume that folks are doing really terrible, but there's many positives that are doing wonderfully. Right, so what, the way that works, when somebody, if they, whether they get tested through their physician's office or the emergency room or you know, however they get tested, um, if they come back positive, we're notified. So what happens is we get that notification with a, with a location. If they live in the city proper, then um, we actually flag that, all right? So that address is flagged in our CAD system so that as our folks pull a call there, that they have some some notification this was a positive and it, and really today we're wearing PPE on we're assuming really that m most people are positive right most calls until proven otherwise right so um, so we get flagged that that address gets flagged and then it falls off in about two weeks or so mm -hmm. right so it, it goes away so it, it doesn't stay in there forever or any of those um, in addition as folks I had a question recently about folks that are flying in um, you know, from out of state and particularly these hot spots and, and how's that work? Same idea. So the Department of Health, and they've done a great job. They really have. And um, they, they go through an assessment when folks come off, off that plane. Where, where do you live? Where, where, how long are you going to stay? They, they take temps. They do that sort of stuff. There's an assessment, a screening. And then if they're, li if they're in the city as well, that is also flagged. So they're more of a, a person of interest, <coughs> right, or under investigation. They kind of they kind of, uh, they're in the system as well. And that falls off as well. So actual cases in the city, last I checked, I mean, and again, I don't have the data in front of me, we were at about 10, all right? So for the whole city for, for us. And um, again, when we look at 123 countywide, yeah. pretty good number, right? And of those, I, have, I should say that of those um, 123, there were a um, a large cluster, and that's kind of what we see from community spread. Um, there was a large cluster in several uh, assisted living facilities, right? You've probably read some of that, and, and um, you know, unfortunate, but that's, that's how it works. There, those are not on this side of the river, right, so far, and we hope to keep it that way. Um, the, the Department of Health as well, they've had teams that will come into the assisted living facilities to make sure they're using best practices, they have their PPE, they're, they're going through the process. I think even National Guard was in to help with uh, one of the larger facilities and test everybody, test everybody in the place so you get a real accurate count. So there's, there's been a, a real um, 
uh, a lot of coordination and cooperation from um, from the different groups. So, thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Ray, I would just like to say that you and and what all you've done wow. have, have has just been incredible. I have heard from people all over the country who know that I'm here, hmm. not even knowing that I'm associated with city government, who have said, isn't that the little town you went to? My gosh, you guys are really doing oh, something awesome. good. Well, so, thanks. That, that's, not just, that's not me, that's everybody. It, really, the community's doing a great job. They really are, and there's a lot of players in this. But so. You helped by ordering early. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Proactive. So. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, actually, the reporter asked me, well, how did the governor's um, executive order for Safer at Home affect you all? And I said, well, it really didn't. Same he thing. says, it didn't? <laughs> I said, no. I said, we, we issued a Safer at Home uh, along with our county back on March, I think it was 29th. Uh -huh. And so I actually sent him that information, uh, emailed it to him so he could see it. And I said, so we were prepared. We were, you know, already doing these things. We might have tightened things up a little bit, but um, we really didn't have to react. You know, we were already uh, practicing some of these behaviors. For sure. So. And that's been a group effort. When we meet, you know, we have uh, coordinated uh, conference calls with the county. So we really are doing this in tandem, you know, as a group. And so when we send a message, it is you know, for the most part, the same, the same message. And so that's been a real, a group effort at Howard's uh, direction for sure. Yeah. Other questions? Um, you brought up a very good point, Nancy, that the governor's order is a safer at home order. It is not a stay at home order for those who may be watching. Mm -hmm. um, I have had, I can't even tell you how many emails from people who insist that the media said it was a stay-at-home order and they're only going to listen to the media. And I have argued my point and I've sent them copies of the governor's executive order and, I, and, and they're still arguing with me. I had one over the weekend, six emails back and forth, and I finally just said, the media was wrong. Tampa Bay Times was wrong. It is not a stay-at-home order. It is a safer-at-home order. And what that means is we're asking for voluntary compliance from everybody, mm -hmm. and if they don't listen, then they are subject to possible um, penalties and fines, and, and that's how the, we put some teeth into it. But people are insisting it's a stay-at-home order, and it is not. And I just wanted to put that on the record because there are so many people that are under the mis, under, misinterpreted statement made by some of the media outlets, and that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And even Vern Buchanan, who sends out his weekly newsletter, he had a, a stay-at-home in, in his newsletter. And I sent him a note, and I said, why are you saying that? It's not a stay-at-home <laughs> order. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a state representative. He right. should, or, or federal representative, actually. Yeah. Message management, right? Oh, you got it. Thank you, Ray. All right, no worries. Anything else, Ray? just reach out to me. Glad to Thank, you, Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, and, and appreciate the continuing to update everybody uh, weekly um, and sending out information. I think that's one of the things that's so important is just communicating. Sure, um, and yeah. Melissa's doing a wonderful job with that. She heads that up and she sure makes uh, life easier for me. She, she writes a whole lot better than I do. So. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I do, have right. a, I do have another update on that. The uh, special events, um, when we canceled special events through May 15th, uh, we've actually notified two events that are going to go on towards the end of May, and we've notified them that um, you need to look at a different alternative on how to do the event. There are two running events. They're probably going to go to a virtual. Uh, they're going to still have it, but it will be a virtual event because in good conscience, we don't think that we can have a Memorial Day run with over 700 folks. No. It's just not right. It's not the time yet, even though we may not have a state of emergency anymore. We just had to tell them. And we also have a Girls on the Run event uh, also in that same time frame. We've told them to try and go to virtual. So there will be pretty much no special events throughout May. Do we have to do anything with the state of emergency order? Do we have to extend that? Because it's April 30th no. right now. No, no we, we did ours based on the governor's yeah. declaration. Right. So um, that's where it stands. And when the governor 
whatever whatever time frame he designates, then 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 that that is ours. Mm -hmm. So that's how we handle it. The county has to do it every seven days, I guess. Different. That's why I was asking because I watched part of their meeting yesterday. Yeah, that's why. Now, as far as the farmers markets are concerned, um, they got with us. I can't remember what day it was, and uh, with their alternate started with the uh, Saturday farmers market and uh, um, I know it's been already well publicized mm -hmm. so they came up with a drive-through which is great we said fine that's exactly the way to do it um, it looks like they may be able to start this Saturday we reached out to the Punta Gorda Historical Society and we gave them the same opportunity if they wanted to do a drive-through on Sunday get the vendors lined up for you order online, and then you can then pick up your packages, just like a takeout restaurant. You take a curbside. Um, I haven't heard back from them as to whether or not they got it together yet, but we want to offer both of them the same opportunity. So hopefully they're successful. Okay. Any questions for um, So city attorney. I have nothing, thank you. Nothing, okay. We have a city clerk, uh, and Howard, I think you're going to handle that item for us. City clerk has one item, and that's the Punta Gorda Housing Authority. There are two vacancies. We have two applicants, Mr. Harry Agabetis and uh, Ms. Della Booth. Both terms expired on May 18th. They are both eligible for reappointment. They've expressed an interest in doing so, and they will be for four-year terms. Um, you can certainly nominate and appoint if you would like. I don't nominate and appoint. Second. Okay. Uh, there's been a nomination and a second to nominate and appoint uh, both Mr. Agabetis and um, Ms. Booth to new terms um, on the Public Housing Authority. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Their terms are have been extended. Anything else? No. On uh, policy and legislation, um, we've talked a lot about the COVID-19. Um, I just uh, want to uh, say to all those that are watching how much we really appreciate all that you're doing to take a leadership role and being uh, role models and, and helping uh, set a standard for our community. Uh, we realize that not everybody is or that perhaps the word doesn't get out. Um, I know that it, it, I see somebody sitting on a lawn chair underneath a palm tree watching the, uh, the water at the harbor and it kind of breaks my heart that we have to say, you can't do that. Um, because it's like, so what's, what's the problem with one person um, doing that? Um, the issue then becomes, well, but when we get lots of crowds of people and then the social distancing comes into play, we as an organization have to not encourage gathering. So um, it's, it's just what we have to do at this point in time. And, and I'm, I'm just like um, anybody, I, I can't wait to see us start to reopen things and start to see us uh, get some semblance of, of whatever this new normal is going to be as we kind of progress. But you know we have to make sure we don't do things too soon and that we're safe. Um, so I really appreciate all that you're, you're doing out there. Um, and thank you for all the questions, forwarding questions to any of us that you want to be reassured of something or you want a clarification of something. Um, we appreciate it a lot. So with that, I also want to mention um, Jaha and I are on the, on the Tourist Development Council. And there are a lot of residents um, in this community that um, have been identified by the United Way as, I know they use the term ALICE, and I believe it stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained. Yeah. I believe that's the, how the, what it is. Um, and those are people that are like one, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Those are people that are, ooh, I don't know what's causing this. Maybe it's picking up on is that, that one too. Is that that's sitting there? Is the microphone oh. leaning up against the computer at all? Well, I've just been, I've been sitting in the same spot the whole thing. It's right here. Now it's Don't okay. Move. Don't move. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, those are people that were identified. Uh, back when they did the study, it was probably, what, a couple years ago? 
and they did the study that said they were one paycheck away from a disaster. And these are people that are working, they're carrying, holding two or three jobs, and they, they really want to be vital, a vital part of our community. Well, the disasters happened. And so we all know that um, COAD, uh, community organizations active in a disaster, is formed. And so you can go to coad.com and you can get, inf or is it .org, I think? Org, yeah. .org to get information about that. CoEdFL. CoEdFL.org? Yes. Yeah. Um, you can also go to the Charlotte Community Foundation's website, and they're taking hand-up grant uh, contributions, um, and so, which is a part of the whole co-ed um, effort. And uh, one of the things that the, that the, um, the Punta Gorda, uh, Englewood Beach uh, Visitors Bureau has done is they've come up with a program called Best Side, Your Side. And if you go to bestsideyourside.com, there is information about uh, restaurants that are um, t giving takeout, um, other things we can do. But they also have a, a, a T-shirt that you can buy. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> and for $20, you can purchase one of these T-shirts. This happens to be mine. And um, that I paid 20 Actually, I, I gave them more than $20 because the, the proceeds of these T-shirts are going to co-ed to help these uh, individuals, these families. Uh, as of the April 9th when I was on their website, there have been over 1,400 um, people in our community apply for help. And um, Wendy, um, who is the, uh, the, the executive director of the tourism, um, she was talking to them uh, yesterday and she said that, that um, most of these people that are applying are in the hospitality industry. So that it really is, uh, makes her feel good that, that, that they're really trying to do something to help raise funds for this. And as of yesterday, they had raised over $4,000 toward the co-ed through the sale of these t-shirts. And they just got a big shipment in. And they have all sizes. I know my husband, um, I got him a, a double XL. So um, I just want to encourage everybody to go to uh, bestsideyourside.com, and it says and on the back of the t-shirt, bestsideyourside.com, and um, these could make great gifts because it says greetings from pure Florida, Charlotte County on the front. So you could buy these as gifts and give them out. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you for letting me do this um, not paid advertisement, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's important um, as we help people in this, in this time, and I think that those of us that are watching, there's so many people that are, are blessed, and now it's time for us to share our blessings. So um, that's what I have, and I will turn this over. John? Nothing more. Nothing more. Nothing more. No. Debbie? I have two things. Okay. Uh, one is I have been participating in the COAD uh, large conference call meetings, and I have, I have been overwhelmed with amazement at how fast they went from we need to do something to these are the five committees and here's what we've done already. Um, it, it, they are such a blessing to our community and to the people who really need us. So I also have shirts and anybody that um, feels a need, you can donate directly to the Charlotte Community Foundation mm -hmm. or you can buy a shirt. The other thing is I participated in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Dover Cole this last week. And I'm going to go on the record saying that I am really worried because I spent two days going over their sheet of questions. And I went over all the things that people had said to them in surveys. And the thing that they asked me about were the top, t the top priorities. And when I gave them some of my answers, based not only on my personal opinion, but on what I had seen on these surveys, they were surprised. They, were, they, they didn't know we felt that way. And I think before we go much further, we need to have somebody from their agency come in and talk to us as a group and see where we're headed because the things that they were surprised about were the very things that made us reluctant to adopt the mm -hmm. master plan as opposed to accepting it. And I mean, they, 
Dover called, Do, you know, Mr. Victor Dover said to me, well, we didn't know you felt that way. And I bet I would told them all at least five times in each meeting that this was a concern. So I think we're spending a lot of money to get this done. And before they go much further, we need some reassurance that we are all on the same page. Because honestly, I did not come away from my meeting feeling like they had ever heard a thing people had said to them. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. OK. That's, that's great feedback, Debbie. Thank you. My turn? Yeah. Yes. Um, I have to agree with you, Debbie. Um, I think we're just rehashing the same things over and over and over and over and over and over, and it's ridiculous. And we've hired them now to do our uh, LDR updates and to review all the city codes and all of that sort of thing. I think they need to work on what we hired them to do and not ask the same questions a hundred more times and expect us to give them a different answer than we've already given them. I told them that as well. Um, and I, I want to see them get, get down to business and, and move things forward. We're wasting valuable time and valuable money at this point, And I want to see things move forward. We've got, we've got some things we have to get done sooner than later and let's get to it. And I'll, that's all I'm going to say about it as well. Um, I have one other thing, and that is that I've been asked to share with the city manager that someone, uh, well, several people in the community would like us to include something in the weekly report regarding um, there are at least a dozen things on this year's uh, election ballot, at least a dozen, including three possible city council election seats. There is going to be an awful lot of paraphernalia being distributed at people's houses, advertising for certain people's campaigns. There's a lot of people that are not here for the summer, many of whom have already left. Um, and I've been asked if we could put something in the weekly that says something along the lines of, if you are gone for the summer, please have one of your neighbors keep an eye on your house and pull in paraphernalia that may be hanging on your front door or laying in your driveway so we don't have random pieces of collateral flying around the neighborhoods because we have a number of people who have already left for the summer or will be shortly if the, it, once the, the safer at home order is lifted. And I, there's concern that we have, a, we do have a no soliciting policy in the city. However, that really doesn't stop people and uh, from doing what they're not supposed to do and also um, Political and fraternal and religious organizations are not subject to the to the federal law about um, solicitation. So there probably will be a lot of instances where we have various pieces of collateral being left on people's front doorsteps or um, on their driveways. And I was asked if we could do something about keeping some kind of control over that. Um, it's going to be on the May 20th uh, City Council agenda because I've actually brought forward uh, uh, a request in burnt store aisles uh, that we have uh, need to amend our ordinance, and David has weighed in on it. And I'm not—I don't agree with David's um, uh, opinion. And so it's going to be discussed at the May 20th uh, council meeting, um, so that we can uh, do something that may be um, constitutional. We're talking about solicitation versus versus canvassing and that sort of thing. Um, uh, it's more. Um, has to do with leaving materials mm -hmm. at someone's home when nobody's there. Okay. And um, I, I appreciate your issue um, in my cul-de-sac. I'm the only house. And I'm not their caregiver. I'm not their caretaker of these properties. And, um, and I, I could cite, you know, all the instances that have gone on over time mm -hmm. where I'm you know, having to do things, and it's like, I had to be honest with one of my neighbors. I am not your, right. they don't even live here. Yeah. And they're only here one week a year. <laughs> I'm not your, <laughs> I'm not your, your maintenance. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too. So um, we're going to discuss it. Okay. It will be on our agenda. Good. Good. Yes. So I'm sure that we'll have a lively discussion. <laughs> okay, thank you. And do we need to uh, request a discussion 
of where we are with Dover Coal? Yeah, if you if, if you want Dover, a representative of Dover Coal to actually come in front of City Council, yes, we need to hear if Council wants to do that. Well, I think they have met with all of us, right? And they've met with all the Planning Commission. In and so if, if, it, if we feel like we need to make sure we're all calibrated and on the same page, if, you know, if it's either Mitchell coming here and giving feedback. Oh, so no, 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 no. Okay. If you want to, if you need to hear from Dover Coal, not city staff, if my, that's what you want. My understanding was that they are updating the presentation. Is that true? From these discussions that we've They had? have, they will be taking notes. This is informational. They got information from the one-on-ones. Right. Mm -hmm. They are now going back to work. And what are they going to do with that information? So what I'm hearing from you all is you want to see what is their assessment so that we can make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, if you want them to come in front of you and to get a little more definitive direction as a body, we can have them come here. We may want to do that, but that's just going to keep pushing things further back. I think they need to get on the stick and start working on what we hired them to do. They're not doing that. Well, is that true? I mean, I thought that was always that was going on in the background. Well, not with they, the questions they asked me. Not, not that list of questions they sent to us for those one-on-one -on -one meetings. That's the same questions that got asked during the charrette process a year ago. Why are we doing this again? And I didn't, my talk had to be abbreviated because they had to go someplace. So I only had 32 minutes mm -hmm. and we never got off the top 10 priorities. Mm -hmm. I, I expected more from them. What was the purpose of these one-on-ones? For them to gather information, information so that they can continue with their updating of the comprehensive plan and the LDRs. So it does supposedly feed back into their work plan to develop the LDRs and the comprehensive plan? In theory, yes. It sounds to me like it would be helpful if, if someone from that organization could then provide um, just a, re a report to, you know, in person. Uh, here's what we gleaned so that where we established priorities and where they're does that make does that city staff took notes mm -hmm. that's all they did was they took notes right and so they will our staff will prepare a summary of notes that's all it is it's information and um, I presume Dover Cole did the same thing but we will provide them with with the notes if you want somebody from Dover Cole to be here uh, with a summary of those notes. Um, we'll provide you with a summary. The summary will not include what individuals said. Can't do that. It'll just be a summary of information. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to agree with Debbie in some cases that some of this stuff are things that have been said multiple times by multiple residents. I know in Burnstar Isles about the area that's in the south part of our community, and it's just, you know, they're still asking the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, like, so there's obviously a disconnect. Why yeah. are you still asking me, you know, whether or not Jones Loop Road is a priority? Why are you still asking me if it, if, if, it, what, you know, if we should have any kind of, um, it, it, there has to be some element of residence there, but and how, and why are they still focusing on number of stories in the downtown building corridor? That's not what the city council voted on. City council several months ago, now it's probably three or four months ago, we voted as a council unanimously to not have anything reported back to us in terms of stories. We want it in feet. And city attorney opined that we were correct and that was the way it should be done. And they're still talking about stories. I said, I don't ever want to hear that word again. I mean, they should have had that information before those meetings. I think that one, I think it, we, they have to give it to us in stories and feet as opposed to just stories because that's just how the, the, the 
discipline does it. I mean, we we're, our end thing is going to say how much the feed end of the day is, but that's how it's talked about. In the but then why are they asking us what we would rather see? That's not what we voted on. That's not how we voted when we talked uh, talked about that. I, I think for them to just send us a summary of the talks would be another waste of time because, you know, you're, you're getting a consensus of the overall, I mean, I don't know about John, you haven't been meeting with them quite as much as the rest of us, but, you know, I know for well, a fact. I met with them this last week. Well, I know, but I'm saying for the last year, we've been meeting with them and we've been telling them, you know, certain things and why we believe that to be so and that that's the way our community feels. Mm -hmm. And for them to still come up with it like it's this, we got this great thing we're going to do and that's, that's not, I've said all along they don't get us and I'm even more convinced that they still don't get us and I don't know what we have to do. But I, I'd at least, I don't know that we need to go to the expense of having them come here but if they could send us, I don't know. I'm, I'm just so frustrated by this whole thing. I can't even. Um, so how many questions did they, they give you a list of questions? Um, Two typewritten pages of questions. Okay. Yeah. So maybe what would be productive is give them those same questions back and ask them based on their collective interviews what do they understand to be the city's answer to those questions? And then you can determine whether you're on the same page or not. Well, they can give us a summarized written report of all of that. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna, we don't need it a month from now. We need it yesterday, because this is ridiculous. We're just spinning our wheels at this point. For, for example, and I, I'm not familiar with the questions, but with respect to the one having to do with the, the height of uh, buildings, if, if you ask them to you know, what did you understand the city's position to be from um, the in independent one-on-ones? Um, right. And they come back and say something that, well, we understood that the city doesn't want more than X number of stories. That gives you a clear indication that they're not on the same page with you. Yeah. And then, then you can bring them in and say, well, look, this is not where we want to be. Uh, just a thought. That should be easy enough for them to do. I assume they've already done it mm -hmm. in terms of their. Well, I, I don't know if they produced a document or not, but we can certainly ask them. I know our city staff is working on producing a summary. Mm -hmm. We're doing that. So if they would just produce some kind of a summary that could, they could send to us or send, you know, to, to let us know, this is what our takeaways. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should have both summaries, but independent yeah. of each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Work. Because there was one thing that I said to them that they totally misinterpreted, and at the very end of the meeting I said, let me correct you before you go any further, because that's not what I said. And so I, I stipulated what I had said, and they're like, oh, oh, okay, well, we didn't really understand that. I, I had that exact same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's but, concerning. Yeah. It's very concerning. I think we need to get their interpretation of what the one-on-one -on -one meetings came out with. And, and then also have city staff do the same. Separate report, I agree with John, have two separate reports submitted to the council members and we can have a discussion about it at the next meeting. We'll do our best. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I don't even know what I had, just wanted to do on the co-ad again. I have to just remark on how quickly it came together. I mean, literally, it was like Wednesday the world was ending for restaurants and things. And literally by Thursday, it was actually together and funded yeah. to be able to give people grants. It literally was like 24 hours that this was put together. It was like, like stand up in time, so yes. amazing. There's some great things going on in our community with, with really the business are. owners so that proud are. proud of our community. And, and they're, do, they're doing things that we don't, that I as a you know, citizen didn't even think about, like providing showers for the homeless people so they don't have to be in at-risk places to shower. I mean, they're they're going from every, you know every spectrum. I'm I'm just Angela is just doing a fabulous yeah, job. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Okay. Well, um, it's been great being with all of you out there, and, <laughs> and I'm sure that you were fascinated by the discussion and and really uh, enjoyed 
uh, being a part of uh, our meeting today, and we'll look forward to being a part uh, with you again on May the 6th. It might be like this. We don't know, but mm -hmm. stay tuned. Um, and it's, it seems to have worked out for me being here mm -hmm. in yeah. this spot. So it's kind Fine. of helped us open up a little bit more. I think you more. can see us all better. I can see you all. I don't have to look in two different directions. No. Yeah. You still don't call on me, but you can see us. <laughs> well, if you raise your hand. <laughs> okay. So without, uh, if there's no more discussion, then meeting adjourned. Awesome.